Check out all his majesty. Here be dragons, folks. The legendary, often titanous lizards of myths and fantasies. They come in all shapes and sizes. They can be vicious, majestic, adorable, noble and wise, just playing gorgeous, and even just sarcastic and puny. And naturally, we've seen our fair share of draconic bosses, so that makes them perfect for our never-ending quest to list boss fights based on literally everything ever. So, what are the rules this time around? For starters, they need to be considered dragons by canon. So while Ridley's definitely draconic in appearance, he's a burp, not a Durgan. Disqualified! See, when I came up with that rule, there was a little bit of debate in the crew whether or not Maleficent from Kingdom Hearts counted. I mean, yeah, it was a dragon fight, looked like a dragon, felt like a dragon, but she's a fairy, so does that count? Or was she a dragon the whole time and the fairy is her secondary? <gasps> Too many questions. Yeah, moving on. Next, they gotta act like a dragon. Doesn't matter if they're good or bad, they gotta be ferocious and destructive, but also noble and wise as well. Oh, it's really nice lore would be icing on the cake. Dragons are the stuff of legends after all. And most importantly, the boss needs to be challenging and fun. They're dragons. They're the ultimate obstacle in classic storytelling. If it isn't hard or doesn't feel like it's hard, then what's the point? Starting off our list of flying terrors, we need to go back to the patriarch of action RPGs, Yeez. If you remember back in top 10 win bosses, we talked about the hot air balloon dragon, Mu Anti, and how the fight didn't blow. Well, Yeez 7 is known for its dragon bosses as they got five super cool ones that the story revolves around. The ones people love the most are usually the earth and wind dragons. The water one is okay, and the fire one is there. We need to look to the moon, Alice! As descending from on high is the final dragon of the roster, the moon dragon, Zekalios. Zekalios being the final dragon does have a lot to live up to. After beating the water dragon, you really have no idea where this final dragon is as there really wasn't a moon dungeon prior. Well, with some help from an old friend, you find the moon dragon lying at an altar in your current base town. Zikalios descends from above to the reflecting pool arena below. Teleporting around the stage, he swings his wings around to launch cutters at you, shoot beams of light at you, and pelts you with fireballs. Honestly, at the beginning, the fight seems kind of easy. The dragon's attacks aren't really a problem to avoid. Well, that's until you get the lug down to three quarters HP. Then the bright white moon becomes blood red and the pure silver dragon becomes as dark as the other side of the moon. His attacks are now slower, but their range and power are much greater. If you haven't mastered flash guards, you're gonna have a tough time surviving his attacks. These include a shockwave that covers the entire arena, a wide swing of arm, homing fireballs, and a power multi shockwave he charges up. And of course, since he's the final dragon, he has a third phase because of course he does. He goes on all four limbs and starts moving faster than before. His AoE shockwave remains, but then he has homing blood balls, a full swing of his tail, and fire in his laser. He's almost dead by this point. Keep dodging, using powerful skills like Adol's pentagram, and you'll take him out before long. This battle not only acts as the final dungeon fight, but also as the turning point where all of the game's plot is finally revealed. It's the gatekeeper to the final dungeon, so I'm not surprising it will act as the gatekeeper for this list. This gives Dark Side of the Moon a whole new meaning. Definitely mysterious. Dragons and Fire Emblem are like cereal and milk. They're always a part of a complete medieval fantasy breakfast without the high fructose corn syrup. Although the series does often portray dragons more like gods rather than legendary creatures. Which would be fine, but there aren't so freaking many of them! With all that said, there is one dragon in the series that can be considered truly legendary, Degincea, the king of dragons from the Tellius Saga. In the Radiant Duology, the Dragon Lagoos are portrayed as the most powerful of the beast tribes. They live in seclusion within the land of Goldoa, refusing to partake in any of the world's affairs. This is because Degincea, being their king and one of the ancient heroes of Tellius, made a pact with the goddess Ashra to avoid plunging the world into another cycle of war and chaos. 
Unfortunately, his inaction only serves to worsen the state of the world, as his fellow Lagoo's kin were forced to suffer without his aid. It eventually led to the pact being forcefully broken, and to own up to it, the Dragon King must stand by the goddess as judgment is to be passed on to the world. You finally confront the Dragon King on the Tower of Guidance, and all that lore ain't no hyperbole. As the legendary Black Dragon, his power is insurmountable. Between his huge stature and breath so destructive, it can two-shot even the strongest units you have. On top of that, his special skill Iron can triple the damage he deals in one turn. Good luck to any Iron Man players out there thinking it's safe to send Tabard after him. It's not that hard to believe that this is the same dragon said to have stopped the millennium old war with his sheer might alone. You know he's no slouch, but not only does he intimidate even the other Lagoos kings, but it's said that even Ashra, the goddess, wouldn't want to get on his bad side. On top of that, you're not just fighting him. The entire nation of Goldoa is on his side, so you're gonna have a lot of bulky red and white dragons to handle in your bowl. Your combat units alone aren't gonna cut it against these lizards, so you definitely have to bring your support teammates to make sure you do the most damage and take as few of it as possible in return. It's not nearly as much of a spectacle as the other dragons on this list, but Degensea still excels thanks to his intricate lore and devastating prowess. It all amounts to a really difficult fight that requires you to be on your S game to survive. It's a real shame his voice was not very good. Hold! Hold, I see! But hey, he did appear in an event in Heroes once, so perhaps hope isn't lost for us to see better performances that justify our boy Dag in the future. Hopefully. When you hear Pokemon and Legendary Dragon, what's the first thing that pops into your head? Yeah, hold that thought. Now, yes, Rayquaza is the staple Dragon Legendary of Pokemon, but we're looking at boss fights for this list, and Rayquaza's fights are not exactly spectacular. His Mystery and Dungeon fight is okay, but not particularly thrilling. His brawl fight really underplays his strength, and the main game fights are just the standard for legendaries. Master Ball and done. So where else are we gonna find a dragon with just as much power and gravitas, but puts up a commendable fight? Let's ask Volo if he knows something. Yep, we're pulling in the distortion dragon, baby. You might be thinking, what significance does Giratina play as a dragon compared to Rayquaza? Sure, it's got the type, but it's more like the Satan of Pokemon than anything. Well, my friend, did you know that various depictions of the devil often take the form of a dragon, particularly in Revelation? Not only that, dragons do symbolize power and destruction in many stories, and the sheer mystical presence it holds strikes terror in those who fear the unknown. Fits Giratina perfectly, if you ask me. To top that demonic cake, it worked together with Volo Legends Arceus to open the space-time rift, causing the frenzy of the Lord Pokemon to happen. All to take revenge on Arceus for banishing it. Coincidentally, it also opened the gate for Arceus to pull the player into the region and give the destructive duo the spanking of a lifetime. You fight Giratina after you fight Volo atop the spear pillar. Let me tell you. If you're not prepared to sweep Volo's team, then you will not be ready for what the Ghost Dragon has in store. Giratina hits as hard as the figurative Isekai truck that it is, carrying Aura Sphere, Earth Power, Dragon Claw, and Shadow Force in its moveset. Not only can it one-shot your standard team, but it has ideal coverage against both Dialga and Palkia, so even legendaries are completely safe in this fight. On top of all that, beating its altered form leads to the Origin's second form, trading bulk for higher attack power. Did I mention Shadow Force also obscures the user and makes them dodgier? Yep, not overkill at all! In all seriousness, this is the most challenging Pokemon battle in a long while. It's really exciting to fight a boss that really makes you think about what Pokemon you're using, making the most out of their best attacks and dealing with the shortcomings of each one. There hasn't been a fight this difficult and thrilling in the series since Cynthia, which is very fitting considering how much she intertwines with Volo and Giratina thematically. It's an amazing fight that only makes me more excited to see what more Game Freak will do with the Legends formula. Just imagine this. You're just strolling through the mountains, everything's going nice and smooth, when suddenly, wham! You end up face to face with a massive stony lizard. 
You nearly got your head fried by lightning. Yes, freaking lightning. And it's trying to take a big bite out of you before it finally blasts its way out of the cave, ready to rain chaos down and scorch you right off the mountainside. And thus, we have arguably the largest boss in God of War 2018, Razler, the Thunder Dragon. Already, he is one of the coolest looking dragons you'll ever see. Kind of looks like he's made of stone, and that robot looks like horns on his head adds a little extra bite. Admittedly, Hrazar isn't really the hardest boss in the game, but he's far from a slouch. Thanks to the more cinematic camera work, you'll get an up close and personal feel for how massive this beastie really is. At the very start of the second phase, he'll suck you up into his jaw like an oversized vacuum, and then there's his most deadly attack of all. Lightning breath. As a weather-based consumer of the nostalgic fire-based variety, lightning breath still looks cool. Ultimately, your best bet is to keep your wits about you. Keep running, not dodging. No one to start chipping away at his claws with your axe and gather up as many sap crystals as you can along the mountainside. These beauties are super volatile and explode when hit with lightning. And when he's stunned, start chipping away at any open weak spots and bam! One genuine slayed dragon, and you're safe to sally forth to the summit. Again, it's not a difficult fight, but it looks difficult. And with how cinematic the whole thing is, it's guaranteed to be a lot of fun. Though, something interesting I just thought of. Later on, we encounter two dwarves who were turned into dragons. So now I'm curious. Was Razler always a dragon, or was he also formerly a dwarf who was corrupted by greed in the worst way? And if so... Does that mean we just killed a dwarf? Boo-hoo! <laughs> 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 My life is so dark and gloomy! <laughs> oh, man! <laughs> you know, we like to make fun of edgelords because of how unintentionally funny and cringy they can get. But let's be honest, if any of them were as big and destructive as Deathwing, no one would be laughing anymore. Just look at what happens with the mere act of him flying over Azeroth. Chaos, destruction, and suffering with little to no effort. And just listen to his voice. I am Deathwing. In arrow, in domino, I am the Cataclysm. <laughs> Sorry, first, a little backstory. Once upon a time, our big fiery friend here was a dragon aspect named Neltharion the Earthwarder, empowered by the Titans as one of the protectors of Azeroth. However, the old gods thought it fun to drive him insane, which led him to betraying his fellow dragon aspects and ultimately becoming Deathwing the Destroyer, the final boss of World of Warcraft Cataclysm. Now, why did I call Deathwing an edgelord, you know, other than because of his name? Oh. No reason other than the fact that he willingly had plates of Elementium embedded into his skin. The pain was unbearable, but he didn't care. He'll do whatever he can to see all of the Azra suffers as much as he does. And he won't stop until either everyone in the land dies or he dies. The only way to even start taking Deathwing down is with the Dragon Soul, an item ironically created by Deathwing himself. After that, the real struggle begins. First, you take the battle onto the dragon himself and chip away at his armor using the wild elementals on his back. Thrall shoots him down, Deathwing falls into the ocean, and boom. We did it! We did it! We did it! Yeah! We have done nothing! I will tear your world apart! Yeah, sorry game. Deathwing never learned when to quit. Instead, he is completely sneaky and unleashes a barrage of spine tentacles to flick you out of existence. Take out those abominations and just keep holding out until the dragon soul is ready again. And boom! For real this time. Whew, that was a trip and a half. Deathwing may not be an iconic Warcraft villain compared to the likes of the Lich King, but there's no denying he's one of the most destructive. Heck, the end time dungeon gives us a glimpse of what could have been had Deathwing succeeded. And it is horrifying. And overall, I think the biggest takeaway from this is all gods need to find a better use of their time. Seriously, what the heck, jerks? What? You thought we'd have a dragon boss's list without including Spyro? You don't see a lot of the purple dragon on here, huh? Well, I figured it was time for us to talk about the series Big Bad Malfoy. This guy had build up upon build up throughout the series. 
from showing up as statues in the first game to showing off his power in the third, Malifor has been an ever-present force in the trilogy. It makes sense that when Spyro and his partner Cinder confront him in his lair at the end of Dawn of the Dragon, you have an epic fight awaiting you. It starts as the duel battles Malifor in the skies above his lair. In true Purple Dragon fashion, his power over the elements is staggering, pelting you with fireballs, flamethrowers, and dark energy balls. After a quick quick time event, it was 2008, Malifor literally just starts destroying the world like he planned and sends the two dragons crashing down. You then start fighting him on a fractured stone platform as it descends to the Earth's core. He starts to use other dark energies with a purple shield and ice attacks. Belt and Samara and you get, you guessed it, another quick time event. Again, it was a different time. You get to phase three. This time his shield is permanent and you need to break it. Give it everything you have at this point as it's the final phase. Once the shield's broken, you get the final quick time events. I know, I know, it was 2008. Just be glad we aren't talking about Resident Evil 5. Anyways, Cinder traps Malifor and Spyro knocks Malifor down to the core. They dive after him, but Malifor grabs them and drives them into the wall. Well, two more button presses later, and Spyro rams into him and drives him deeper into the core where he's sealed away by dragon ghosts. Oh yeah, this fight is just playing crazy. From the atmosphere to the stakes at hand. Seriously, a few more minutes and there wouldn't be a world to save. While the scale is great, there are a couple issues. One, the particle effects look great, but they take over the screen. It's hard to see what's going on half the time. And two, it's pretty... short. Cutscenes and quick-time events aside, it only takes a couple minutes to get through all of the battle portions of the fight. That being said, this was still a great finish for the second Spiral Trilogy and a cap-off for the series. You know, until the Skylanders became a thing and burned into the ground. Thank goodness for the Reignited Trilogy. <sighs> In lieu of the Kingdom Hearts entry, here's the Souls-like entry. In the world of Sekiro, you can encounter all kinds of beautiful mythological creatures. Of course, they all want to kill you, so it's not exactly a petting zoo. And what would a game featuring mythological creatures be without dragons? Specifically, the Divine Dragon. Though at first, you fight not the Divine Dragon itself, but rather its- Oh my god! What's wrong with your face? Servants. These sins against nature, the old dragons of the tree. Anyways, the fight against them isn't nearly as terrifying as they look. Avoid the poison and the roots, kill them to reduce the collective health bar. Simple enough, though, I gotta give props to the atmosphere held by the lovely mist and clouds. It's only then that the real fight begins. Holy shit, Yay. that's gorgeous. Oh heck yeah, we're getting an Easter dragon on this list, and yes, it is freaking incredible. Now wielding the seven branch sword, the divine dragon fights with massive blasts of wind. Being so large and imposing, it's difficult to hit directly. Instead, you need to jump off the roots and redirect the lightning back at it. Wait a minute, a boss in a game set in feudal Japan with a multi-pronged sword and shoots lightning. You're kidding. Like all Sekiro bosses is a feast for the eyes and like all Sekiro bosses, it's topped off with a brutally satisfying death blow. The only real thing keeping this fight from being higher is that it's a bit on the easy side. Well, easy by Sekiro standards anyways. It's not a From Software game if I don't break at least one controller. <laughs> Ari? Yeah? How did Fatalis get on our list again? Aren't there like a million elder dragons? Yeah, but none of them are as cool as Fatalis. But he was just on fire bosses! Well then he can be a fire dragon type. It works for him. <sighs> Good gravy. Yeah, we actually did it. We put the same boss on two boss lists in a row. They were kind of asking for it when we decided to do dragon bosses of all things after fire. Don't worry, we won't do that again. I hope. Anyways, yeah, I know there are a million elders and there's probably a better fight somewhere. Maybe Shagaru Magala from 4 or Shara's Valda from Iceborne. Personally though, nothing holds a candle to the absolute intensity that is the fight from World. Its flames can melt steel, its body can fling hunters back from just moving. 
Anything less than the strongest and fully augmented armor will have your bones turn to dust from the sheer power on display. All the dragon ear will do is pulse it off. So you really need to kill it or at least break that head if you want to survive more than a few minutes when it gets serious. There's a reason that they give you two extra feints for this fight alone because you will need them. Fatalis has never been a bigger threat than it was here. Or at least, in its base form. For if we head on over to Generations Ultimate again, there's an even stronger version of Fatalis. For you Lord Nuts, you remember that the original Fatalis that destroyed Castle Shade survived and remained dormant throughout time? Well, in the second generation of Monster Hunter, we get to fight this monster. And for you recent players who fought it, and for you and Giyu, you definitely know how powerful the White Fatalis is. White Fatalis, unlike its rageful younger self, turns its burning fire into a tempered stream of red lightning. This makes it even more dangerous, as while you can tell that the fire is coming from its mouth in the base form, the lightning could come from anywhere. It will also come from its mouth a lot too. When it gets down to half HP, it will enter an armor mode where most melee attacks will bounce off. Only weapons at max sharpness or with the skill Mind's Eye will be able to pierce it. So keeping an eye on sharpness is key. At times, it will also fly around the map and pelt the arena with powerful lightning bursts. Eat your heart out, Kieran. When it gets down to 20%, the armor mode will end, but you still need to be careful. This just means you need to kill it faster before it kills you as the White Fatalis gives its final performance. Keep it up and you will knock it down flat. Like in Fire Bosses, I'm putting both the World and GU fights here. Yeah, the World fight is technically better, but the White Fatalis is in a league of its own as a dragon and will test players even more in some circumstances. The scale of each fight is the same, it's just the World fight is more build up and pageantry in a sense. In that case, I have no problem putting them here. Fatalis has been on three boss lists already, and he's been in the top three in all of them. Either the boss fight is just that good, or I'm slowly being corrupted by Fatalis. Either one's good for me. There is a song of tragedy, a song of fury, a song of hatred and lost love. A song that inspired a war that spanned a thousand years. The Dragon Song War. Dragons are known to be creatures of long lives and longer memories. The one dragon refused to forget or forgive the murder of his sister. Nidhogg was his name and he vowed to wipe out the ones who killed her along with their children and their children's children. His song of rage and vengeance drew his brood to his side, and together they waged a bloody thousand-year-long conflict. Eventually, the truth of what had happened had become known to the people. King Thordon and his Knights Twelve had struck down the great worm Bratatosk, not to save the people of Ishgard from a rampaging menace, but to pluck out her eyes, which are a source of unfathomable power. Immediately following her death, Nidhogg flew into battle, losing both of his own eyes. Nidhogg's brother, Rezvilgar, donated one of his eyes to his brother to keep him alive. A thousand years later, and the lies told to the people came to light, and a desire for peace between man and dragon was born. But Nidhogg would not hear of it. Knowing that his grief and rage-fueled madness would never allow the bloodshed to end, Rezvelgar allowed the Warrior of Light and Astinian Wormblood into Nidhogg's lair, where they struck down the mighty dragon with the use of one of his own eyes. However, Nidhogg's hatred survived his mortal body. Having been defeated, his anger and bitterness only grew. They fermented within his eyes, and the dragon's will took over Astinian's body. Nidhogg attempted to reignite the war and to wipe out the people of Ishgard once and for all. The final confrontation came at the Steps of Faith, with one of Reisvelgar's eyes in hand and Reisvelgar himself wounding the shade of his brother. The Warrior of Light faces off against Nidhogg one last time. The battle itself is magnificent. Fiery beats of his wing can scorch a party to cinders. His very roar rattles your bones. Cursed lightning falls upon your party at random places at random times. And of course, 
Nidhogg summons some of his own brood to attack you. While these measures are insufficient, Nidhogg calls upon the captive flesh of Estinian to perform a Star Diver with the full fury of one of the first brood behind it. Now her race vulgar's eye, all hope would have been lost. Still, Estinian's form is put to use, attempting to run you through with his mighty spear and tactics learned from a lifetime as the Azure Dragoon. When even these ill-gotten techniques do not yield victory, Nidhogg resumes his true draconic form, this time glowing a demonic hellish red. He attempts to put the party down with Akmorn, Bahamut's signature attack. Appropriate, giving the name translates to Fated Death in the Tongue of Dragons. Even with his mighty power, the Warrior of Light doggedly survives and finally, finally slays Nidhogg once and for all, ending the Dragon Song War. Maleficent, Kingdom Hearts, Fairy Dragon, Fairy Dragon, Fairy Dragon, hmm. Dragon Lord Pasitisax, Elden Ring. Oh, f we can teleport? Boontail, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door. This worthy and fitting challenge to cap off the Pit of 100 Trials has a hilariously dark backstory. Jack of Blades, Fable, somehow. Jack of Blades returned as a dragon. Argrok, Twilight Princess. So there's some all right dragon boss fights and purely from a boss fight standpoint, this one in particular is pretty epic. Divine Dragon, Legend of Dragoon. It doesn't breathe fire, but it doesn't have an eye laser and a freaking team wiping energy cannon. At least you can find it only once. Stone Dragon, Sly 3. The Great Stone Dragon has awakened. And for a stealth platform, honestly not bad. Landia, Kirby's Return to Dreamland. Someone's been taking lessons from DDD on how to make yourself look like a bad guy trying to save the world. Singe, Dragon's Lair, the original controller breaker. If we rank by difficulty alone, he'd top this list. Making this list, I thought picking a candidate from Dragon Age would be a no brainer. Unfortunately, despite the name and my love for the series, it rarely has any dragon fight I'd consider amazing. It's kind of disappointing, honestly. So if I can't count on Dragon Age, I suppose I'll have to look for another game with dragon on its title and see if it can satiate our need for a great dragon boss fight. Dragon's Dogma, Dark Arisen, tells the tale of a prophecy called the Endless Chain, a cycle bound by a godlike entity called the Seneschal, where an Arisen is chosen every generation to fight a dragon as a test to succeed the Seneschal in their place. The dragon in question is Grigori, who wreaks destruction across the land of Grancis, eventually finding people brave enough to stand up to him. For this, he takes their heart and makes them the Arisen, bounding them to fulfill the prophecy, all the while keeping them immortal until the dragon himself is slain. Right off the bat, Grigori left a wonderful impression. Large as life, wise and imposing voice, and doesn't take Yay. from any chaos-loving cult. You see this, Grima? Here's the Chad Dragon. By the time you face off against him, he captures your chosen love interest, which is determined by the game's half Yay. matchmaking system, and tempts you into an offer. Either stand and fight, or sacrifice your beloved to the dragon, and become a sovereign of the land. Such is the fate of the Arisen before you. Of course, picking the ladder just gets you the Shadow Queen ending, so there's really only one option here. You would face me then. Ah, tis a fool's choice, Arisen. But better fool than Craven. I knew your mind ere you came. Starting off, Gregory will chase you out of the temple, breathing fire and dropping debris and whatnot. You can fend him off for a while, but your attacks can only barely scratch him. The only way to really hurt him is to aim for his heart. Do enough damage, and Grigori takes off to the skies, where you gotta track him down and shoot him from atop the Ballista Tower. Afterwards, Grigori attacks you one more time, and you climb onto him. The spectacle of this phase is absolutely breathtaking. You'll get an amazing view of the clouds and canyons across the Tainted Mountains as you scale Grigori's back. Ultimately, you drag him down with you into the soil of the mountains where you settle the score with him once and for all. Grigori will fly and climb up cliffs as he dives toward you and blasts fireballs all across the battlefield. 
all the while, you and your team whittle down what's left of the dragon until he draws his final breath. On top of that, he can possess your allies and even cast his own elemental spells at you, from ice, lightning, to beams of light! It might be a hint that he was likely a sorcerer in his past life. As he dies, the Arisen gets their heart back, resulting in previous Arisen succumbing to their fate, and grants this ripping open to reveal the Seneschal's domain. Passing the test, it's up to the surviving Arisen to decide the fate of the prophecy from there on. This is such a complete fight, with varying phases, stunning visuals, and Gregory himself playing the de facto role of the dragon, serving as a major adversary leading to the player's greatest challenge. The only, only downside to this fight is that it's not all that difficult. It looks difficult, but it really isn't. You're more than likely to deal a lot of damage given the level you're at when you face him. Adding on, poison and science can cripple him easily, and weapons imbued with darkness will take a good chunk out of his health. There's also a The End style shortcut where you can kill him with the Maker's Finger before the fight even starts, but that's more like an Easter egg than anything else. Even with a little lack of difficulty, this game makes the fight look like slaying the dragon was hard. Seriously, this fight is gorgeous! If anyone asks me what comes to mind when I think a dragon fight, I choose this. It keeps you thrilled and on your toes with each phase and nails so much of the feel and mystique of fighting a legendary beast of yore. Something most Western RPGs have struggled to capture for a while. I'm looking at you, Alduin. For living up to his lore and grandeur, Grigori earns his spot as the greatest dragon boss. I'm Josh Scorcherin. Bonnie, can you call me Exorcist? I have them on speed dial. Wait, really? Cop! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.